from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning. My name is Joy Mason. I'm an administrative assistant at the Library of Congress, and it is my great honor to introduce Peter Brown. Mr. Brown is both an author and an illustrator of children's books, including Mr. Tiger Goes Wild, Ter uh, Children Make Terrible Pets, and The Curious Garden. He has also won a Caldecott Award for Creepy Carrots. Today, Mr. Brown is here to discuss My Teacher is a Monster. I have read this book and I completely agree with Booklist's review that this playful, eye-catching story goes a long way to humanize both teachers and students. So now, without further ado, please welcome Mr. Peter Brown. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here today. Um, as you heard a few minutes ago, most of the stuff is going to be on the screen, I'm afraid to say. So if you can't see the screen, take a minute to maybe read. There's a few seats over here still. Uh, I'm going to be reading stories and stuff. It's going to be on the screen. So now you understand. Um, anyway, I am an author. I'm an illustrator. And I'm wondering if anybody else here likes to draw pictures the way I like to draw pictures. Do you guys like drawing pictures? I bet a lot of you like drawing pictures. Raise your hand. Does anybody here like to write stories? A few of you must like to write stories. OK. Well, this is a room partially filled with authors and artists. I, I expected a few more hands in the air. Come on, people. Adults, just because you're, you're older doesn't mean you can't draw pictures and write stories. Um, well, anyway. Those are my two, two of my favorite things in the world to do. And I think I was lucky because when I was a kid, my grandfather was an artist. And uh, this is one of his paintings. Now, he, did, he sometimes painted pictures of houses. He sometimes painted trees. And sometimes he did something like this, which you might call an abstract painting. That is on the screen, right? Yes. Um, and, uh, but the bottom line is I would go and I'd visit my grandfather, and I'd see this old man making art which was pretty cool. And I remember as a kid thinking to myself, someday I want to be an old man making art. <laughs> and I'm, I'm getting closer every day to achieving that goal. I might have achieved it already. Um, but because I had this artist in my life, I think I took art a little more seriously than some of my friends did, as you can tell by my early masterpieces like this one. <laughs> I call this Blue Horsey with Sunshine. <laughs> I did this during my Blue Horsey period which is a joke about Picasso, but also kind of a real thing because I grew up near a lot of farms. And so when I was a kid, I drew the things around me. I drew things like dogs and trees and horses and my mommy. <laughs> There's a drawing of my mommy from my mommy drawing period. Um, my dad, funny, funnily enough, my dad is a, a physicist and a mathematician, and I'm sure he was a little disappointed when he realized that I was much better at drawing than I was at counting. Because if you look carefully, you'll notice I accidentally gave my mommy one, two, three, four, five, six fingers on her left hand. But I've recently mastered the art of finger counting, so don't worry about me. Um, speaking of the number six, I was six years old the first time I made a book. Um, and this book that I made when I was six was inspired by something that happened to me in my life. The books I make today are inspired by things that happened to me in, life, in my life, and so was the very first book. And what happened to me was I had a dog, and his name was Buffy, and one day my dog ran away. And my family looked around the house, we looked around the yard, we looked around the neighborhood, we asked all our neighbors if anybody had seen Buffy the dog, and nobody knew where my dog was. I went to sleep that night as a little sad little six-year-old not knowing where my dog was. I didn't even know if I would see him again. I was worried about him. When I woke up the next morning, the first thing I did was I opened the door, the front door, and there was Buffy slobbering all over the front steps. So I knew that everything was going to be OK. But it got my imagination going, and I began wondering, what was Buffy doing all night long <laughs> out in the woods by himself? You know, I had all sorts of crazy ideas for different adventures he might have had. And so with a little help from you know who, <laughs> I made my very first book called The Adventure of Me and My Dog Buffy. So I thought today I'd read to you my very first book that I ever made in my whole life, and it's pretty terrible. <laughs> but it's also pretty short, so you don't have to, the pain won't last too long. Um, so let's see what happens in the very first book I ever made in my whole life. 
There's the title page. I'm sure that was my mom's idea. Um, and there's the drawing I made when I was six of Buffy the dog out on a tree branch. The real dog did not climb trees, which is too bad. That would have been pretty cool. But one of my favorite parts about telling stories, of course, is that something that can't happen in real life, like a tree climbing dog, <laughs> can happen in a story and work just fine. So let's find out what happens. Let's see. OK. One day, Peter and Buffy were playing tag. Except Buffy had a strange way of playing. He always climbed up a tree and then jumped on Peter. And there's a drawing of Buffy climbing a tree, about to climb a tree. One day, they were playing tag, and Peter was it. He tried to get Buffy, but Buffy was too fast. Buffy probably increased his energy because they only played in the summer. I don't know what that means, but let's, let's just keep going. Buffy got himself and Peter lost in the woods. They had to sleep in the woods all night. And there's, there's my drawing of Buffy sleeping on the ground like a normal dog. And then there's my drawing of Peter sleeping, standing up like a very strange little boy. Uh, don't try that at home, folks. I tried when I was a kid to sleep standing up once. I don't really remember why, but I only tried it once because I learned the hard way that it never works out well. So don't try that at home. So they had to sleep in the woods all night. When it was morning, Peter was cold. So Buffy got on top of Peter, and it was warm. I guess that's called body heat. Um, when it was 8 AM, Buffy climbed a tree. He could see the whole woods and Peter's house. So they're lost in the woods. Buffy climbs a tree, sees the house off in the distance. Buffy jumped down and ran to Peter's house. Peter was close behind him. When they got home, everyone got Buffy a bone. Buffy was a hero. The end. <laughs> Thank you. You're too kind. Seriously. Um, <laughs> but that was the first story I ever made. I loved it. I wrote more stories. I drew more pictures. Um, when, I was in the seventh, when I got a little older, I became really interested in cartoons and caricatures, and I did this creepy painting right here. Yeah. Ew. Yeah, that's the reaction you're supposed to have. I was in the seventh grade. I was trying to do kind of creepy things, you know? When I got a little older, when I was in high school, I became pretty serious about drawing and painting, and I, I got much better at drawing horses. Um, I would go to the farms near my house and draw animals. I'd go to the zoo and draw zoo animals. And I eventually went to college to study art, illustration, writing. And I realized that I wanted to make children's books. So while I was in college, I started making art I thought you might see in children's books, like this piece, and playing around with different art styles and stories and characters. Then I graduated from college, and I spent some time traveling. I always get very inspired when I travel. So I bring a little notebook with me and draw pictures of buildings and plants and whatnot. And then I moved to New York City, which is where I live now, and I started making children's books, professionally, getting them published, actually, miraculously. And, um, and so those are the 10 picture books I've made in my life. And now I want to talk to you a little bit about my newest book. And the start, the idea for my newest book came from when I was a kid. I don't know why I was so sad in my Superman costume. But I'm glad that I was, because it makes a much more interesting photograph. <laughs> uh, the truth is, when I was a kid, when I was around this age, I started going to school, right? I started going to kindergarten. And there's a big, that's a big change to go through, going from not going to school to then suddenly going to school. I was used to my parents kind of yelling at me, you know, when I misbehaved. And then I went to school, and there was this new person who was allowed to yell at me. <laughs> and I was like, who do you think you are? <laughs> I get away with all kinds of stuff at home. I don't know what the big problem is here. And I was a sensitive kid, so sometimes I would misbehave, and a teacher might yell at me, and I would not be happy about it. And I'd be like, that teacher is mean. And I had a big imagination, right? So sometimes there was actually a time in my life when I thought that one of my teachers was a monster in disguise. I thought that when we left the classroom, she turned off the lights and morphed into a monster. I didn't have any evidence that that actually happened, but I was, pretty, I was pretty sure that was what happened. And then a funny thing happened. So that teacher, I, she had us do a drawing in class one day. And she was walking around, seeing all the drawings that the different students were doing. And she walked up to me, and she looked at my drawing, and she said, Peter, that is an excellent drawing, which felt really good. 
And then she picked up my drawing and she said, I love this drawing so much, I need to share this with the art teacher and the principal, which was a little confusing to me, but there it was. She picked up my drawing, she walked down the hallway, found the art teacher, found the principal, showed them my drawing and said, look at this excellent drawing that Peter just did. He's really good at drawing, he really loves to draw, we need to do something about this. And just like that, I started taking extra art classes in elementary school. Just like that, I started feeling like I was a real artist. Suddenly everybody was telling me I was an artist. And I was like, I guess I'm an artist. That's cool. And I had these extra classes. Of course, that started this whole snowball effect. And I took extra classes outside of school. And my parents were really supportive. And I started making all sorts of the fun things that kids love to do, writing and drawing and building things, was now it was like a real thing that I was encouraged to really do, not just while I was a kid, but onto my teenage years and to college. And now I'm a professional author and illustrator. And it might not have happened. I'd like to think it would have happened anyway, but it might not have happened if that monster teacher <laughs> hadn't intervened at that point in my life. So I learned a valuable lesson, which was that that teacher was not a monster. First of all, she was actually pretty cool. And that is one of the many inspirations for my new book, which is called My Teacher is a Monster. It's actually called, My Teacher is a Monster. No, I'm not. <laughs> That's the full title of the book. So I thought today I'd read to you my newest book. And now you know a little bit about why I dreamed this book up in the first place. So there's the title page. And now let's begin the story. Bobby had a big problem at school. Her name was Miss Kirby. And there we see a monster teacher named Miss Kirby saying, Robert! Now I'm the author of this book, but I'm also the illustrator of this book. So the pictures are especially important to me. Let's take a look at the pictures there, if you can see them, hopefully. We see a classroom. We see a teacher who looks pretty tough and mean. Uh, we see in the middle of the class is a kid. And from his hand, there's a dotted line and if we follow the dotted line around the page, we see that it leads to a paper airplane. Bobby has thrown a paper airplane in class. He is not exactly innocent in this situation, I don't think. Miss Kirby stomped. And there we see her stomping around, saying, move it or lose it. Miss Kirby roared. And there we see her saying, settle down. There we see Miss Kirby saying to Bobby, no recess for children who throw paper airplanes in class. Miss Kirby was a monster. <laughs> no recess? Come on. That is not cool. <laughs> Bobby spent his free time in the park trying to forget about his teacher problems. And there we see him cruising through the park. It's a nice little park. It's got a gazebo thing and some ponds and some trees and even a big hill in the background. But one Saturday morning, on his way to his favorite spot, Bobby found a terrible surprise. <gasps> it's Miss Kirby. And she's not in school. Why is she not in school? Bobby wanted to run. He wanted to hide. But he knew that would only make things worse. So he had to walk over and sit on the park bench next to his monster teacher. There we see Bobby raising his hand. <laughs> and then Miss Kirby says, Robert, you don't need to raise your hand out here. <laughs> so he lowers his hand. What were you going to say? I was going to say, hello, Miss Kirby. Hello, Robert. <laughs> I like your enormous hat, Miss Kirby. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Miss Kirby, it's really strange seeing you outside of school. I agree. <laughs> and then there was an awkward silence. <laughs> and then a gust of wind changed everything. And we can see there's this gust of wind that comes along and blows Miss Kirby's big goofy hat off of her big goofy head. <laughs> and they go running after it. And she says, that's my favorite hat. My dear old granny gave it to me. Don't let it get away. 
And just as the hat is about to land in the pond and be ruined, Bobby grabs it and says, got it. Oh, Bobby, you are my hero. <clears throat> I mean, that was very good of you, Robert. <laughs> You're welcome, Miss Kirby. And if you look, you'll see some ducks are swimming around in the pond there. And one of the ducks says, quack. <laughs> Those ducks sure do like you. And then the ducks say, quack, quack. They know I enjoy quacking with them. <laughs> and then the ducks say, quack, 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 quack. So Miss Kirby likes to quack. The ducks like to quack. I wonder if Bobby likes to quack. The answer is yes. And here we see them all quacking together. Miss Kirby says, quack, quack. And then a duck says, quack. And then Bobby says, quack, quack. And then the other ducks say, quack. Quack, quack. So there's a whole lot of quacking going on. When they were all quacked out, Bobby had an idea. He says to Miss Kirby, you should see my favorite spot in the park. And so they leave the ducks behind, and they start climbing this hill. Miss Kirby says, be careful. Bobby says, yes, Miss Kirby, although he's not really paying attention to her. So they climb this hill up to the very top to Bobby's favorite spot, and there they are, sitting in Bobby's favorite part of the whole park, and Miss Kirby says, this is lovely. And then Miss Kirby had an idea. She reaches into her bag and she gives Bobby a piece of paper. And Bobby starts folding the piece of paper, and Bobby makes himself a paper airplane at the top of the highest hill in the entire park. What do you think he should do now? <laughs> I think maybe we know where this is going. Bobby tossed his paper airplane into the sky, and it flew, and it flew, and it flew around and around and around. And then Bobby said, I think that was the single greatest paper airplane flight in history. And Miss Kirby says, I think you're right. By lunchtime, Bobby and Miss Kirby were happy they had bumped into each other. And there we see them back at the park bench where the whole thing started. But things look a little different now. When Bobby realized that Miss Kirby liked reading in the park, and she wore big goofy hats that her dear old granny gave to her, that she liked quacking with the ducks, and she was willing to climb hills and throw paper airplanes, he slowly realized that she wasn't actually a monster after all. And so he started seeing her differently, and so we started seeing her differently as we're reading the story. And that's why we see two people sitting on a park bench together. So by lunchtime, they were happy they'd bumped into each other, but they were ready to say goodbye. <laughs> and Miss Kirby says, see you Monday, Bobby. And Bobby says, bye, Miss Kirby, as he runs off with his new paper airplane. Back at school, Miss Kirby still stomped. And there we see her walking around saying, coming through. Miss Kirby still roared. And there we see her reading a book and saying, and then the bear said, roar. But was Miss Kirby still a monster? Robert! <laughs> Personally, I love stories where the characters don't learn anything at all. <laughs> That's not true. That's not true. Bob, they both learned a lot, actually, during this experience. But Bobby just can't help himself. He has got to throw that paper airplane. And when he does, Miss Kirby will be there to correct him. And that is the end. All right. So I'm going to do a drawing here for you guys and see if I can do it in a way where people can actually see me. Um, so I've been, you know, drawing my whole life, basically. And I'm sorry, people over there. I don't know how to do this. This, this speaker is going to be kind of in the way. Maybe I can, maybe I can do this. This might work. All right. Well, we'll do the best we can. Um, 
I've been drawing my whole life, and uh, so I've learned a couple of tricks over the years about drawing. Can you kids draw a straight line? Yeah. Yes, no problem. What about a circle? Yeah. What about a squiggly line? Yeah. yeah, okay, good. If you can draw those things, you can draw just about anything. You just have to know where to put the straight lines, where to put the circly lines, and where to put the squiggly lines. So I'm going to draw some of those lines on this piece of paper, and it's going to look like Miss Kirby, the monster version of Miss Kirby. So I'm going to start with one shape like this. This is probably the hardest shape of the whole drawing. Not exactly a square or a rectangle, but there it is. Now I'm going to draw two straight lines like so. Now I'm going to draw two circles. I promise this will make sense eventually. OK. And then another straight line. So a lot of straight lines, a lot of circles. Here's some curvy lines over here. And then two curvy lines over here. So you can see she's got her arms off to the side. Now I'm going to draw, let's see, I'll draw her shirt collar, which is kind of like two triangles. And then buttons are easy. Those are just circles. Now I'll draw her dress. Curvy line here, one over here, straight line. OK. She's got this kind of frilly thing on the bottom of her dress. Now I'm going to draw her legs. I'm going to draw, she's got two legs, but I'm going to draw three straight lines. You'll see what I mean, how this works. One, two, three. And then I'll draw her shoes. They're funny little pointy shoes. Okay. Now I'll draw her mouth. Got some big teeth. Okay. Uh, I'll draw her hat. Straight line like this. And then she's got a flower on her hat and a stripe. Now I'm going to draw her hair. Her hair is fun and easy. This big squiggly shape. OK. She's got big rhino-like nostrils. And then her eyes. Okay, there are her eyes. I like to add some little plants and things next to her. She's outside again in the park with her hat on. And then uh, and then I sign my drawing. And that's how you draw Miss Kirby. I actually forgot her claws, but now she's done. OK. So does anybody have any questions for me at all about writing, drawing, uh, tree climbing dogs, six-fingered moms, monster teachers, anything like that? Yeah. Is it a fraternity of illustrators? Do you get together and influence Say that again. I'm sorry. Uh, is it a fraternity of illustrators? Yes. Actually, children, close your ears for a second. Uh, I organize a monthly drink night for authors and illustrators of books for young readers uh, <laughs> in Brooklyn, New York, where I live. Once a month, we get together and um, share stories. It's actually it's called Kid Lit Group Therapy because, believe it or not, this is a really lo weird line of work. Um, it's a lot of fun, but there are some struggles as well as there are with everything. So. Uh, 
you know, we commiserate with each other. Um, yes, yeah. Are you? Oh, nice. Oh, that's great. That's really nice to hear. Thank you. I dedicated the book to misunderstood teachers and their misunderstood students because because <laughs> I was definitely one of those. Uh, and my mom was a teacher, actually. She was a, a special ed elementary school teacher for 25 years. So I kind of got to see different perspectives on things. You'd think with a, mom, with a teacher for a mom, I would have understood teachers a little better. But in first and second grade, you know, whatever. Uh, yeah. Can you talk a little about your illustration process? How much is digital versus traditional, things like that? Sure. So for my last book, this one, and the one preceding this, Mr. Tiger Goes Wild, I you, I, I hand-painted the first few books that I ever made, and then I started using a computer in different ways. So for these books, what I did is I painted little shapes. You know how I talked about simple shapes, rectangles and circles and triangles on the drawing here? Well, if you look at the cover there, you know, you see a lot of those shapes right there in the art. So I would paint little black shapes on a white piece of paper, and I'd, even the like white collar on Miss Kirby's dress started off as black triangles on white paper. I scanned all those little shapes, circles and squares and triangles and whatnot, into my computer, layered them over top of each other, and then changed the color of each of those different layers, um, which is, for me, a lot of fun. It allows me to kind of be a little bit more of a designer, and, uh, and I can adjust the color. Everything can be perfect. I'm a bit of a perfectionist. So this is both a blessing and a curse using Photoshop like this, because it allows me to be really detail-oriented, but sometimes it can get the best of me, and I can get carried away with my perfectionism. So, yeah? How did you think of The Curious Garden? How did I think of The Curious Garden? So my fourth book is called The Curious Garden, and it's inspired by a place in New York City called The High Line. The High Line is a lot like The Curious Garden. It was this old abandoned railway that had become overgrown with wildflowers and plants and trees and things, and then now they've turned it into a park. And if you ever go to New York City, the first place you should go is the High Line, because it's like no other park in the world, and it's fantastic. So I, I found the High Line, thought it was amazing, decided that I wanted to write a story sort of along those lines, but I didn't actually want to tell the story of the High Line. I wanted to take it even further and kind of imagine what the possibilities would be if the plants were to grow across the entire city. And um, so that was the inspiration for the Curious Garden. I think I have time for one more question. How about, yeah, over here. Um, what is your favorite thing to draw? My favorite thing to draw, that's a good question. And the answer is easy, trees, no question. I love drawing trees. I, if you give it a trunk and leaves, it looks like a tree, which allows a lot of flexibility because I can have tree trunks that bend and twist and curve around, and I can have a tree with one leaf or 20 leaves or 10,000 leaves or just big leafy shapes. And so whenever I begin a book, I usually begin by figuring out what the trees look like in that book. And once I know what the trees look like, I can apply the same kind of ideas, designs, and themes to the characters and to the other things that appear in the illustrations. So I love drawing trees. Guys, I'm all out of time. Thank you so much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.